<laughs> if they didn't know who you are. Uh, so uh, we have to close at 2.30, really, because uh, otherwise people uh, will have uh, to leave before. Uh, so I will be asking all the speakers to be short, really to the point, so that we can have the discussion we wanted to have. Suma, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, I think I can, can I use this mic? Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Thanks very much, uh, Jean, and good afternoon, everyone, and uh, I'm really sorry that I'm so late. Uh, it was honestly Eurostar's fault, not ours, <laughs> and, uh, but we're glad to have made it to Brussels, and thank you all uh, for making this later start. Um, it's indeed a real pleasure to be here at uh, Bruegel, I think, uh, addressing such an important issue at a very important time indeed as well. I think the challenges facing Europe and the wider world have rarely been so great. But they're matched, I think, by the potential, actually, to tackle those challenges if, and if we are brave enough to seize the opportunities and recognize the path forward. So it's against that background that I want to set out some thoughts on how European development policy can enhance its impact even when budgets are likely to get much more stretched. Uh, I believe that the organization that I lead, the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, EBRD, can play a very important part in that process. Now, there used to be a frequently told joke that the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development was the most misnamed of organizations. Uh, Would-be comedians used to say uh, that it wasn't European, it wasn't a bank, it didn't do reconstruction, and it certainly didn't do development. Um, well, the jokers were wrong, in my view, in every aspect. Uh, the European in the EBRD's name is guaranteed because the majority of shares in the bank are owned by the European Union, member states and institutions, a majority that's going to still be in place after Brexit. In fact, I'm going to be emphasizing during this speech that the EBRD is an important motor for European integration. But the comedians are also wrong because we've always been a bank, looking to invest at commercial interest rates in bankable projects, making profits which are then recycled into yet more loans. And they were wrong on the R too because we've often been involved in reconstruction you only have to look at our work in the Balkans uh, to see how we've been investing to remedy the economic and physical damage that was wrought there by the wars of the 90s and today, of course, in our newest country of operations, Lebanon too. And they were wrong on the D in our name because now more than ever, we're at the forefront of development policy, building sustainable market economies to deliver the goals of the European Union and the wider international community. Now, from a personal angle, I've been involved in international development most of my professional life. First, uh, really implementing projects in Botswana and Sub-Saharan Africa, then the World Bank, uh, later as head of the UK Department for International Development, and for the past six years as president of EBID. So I've seen it off from all sides of the street, working for a recipient government, then as a shareholder in DFID, and now within the multilateral system at the EBID. And it seems to me that there's never been a more urgent need to reassess what we're doing and how we do it. The debate on how best to deliver European and indeed global development policy is more live than it has been for many, many years. In the EU, uh, I actually thank the president of the European Investment Bank, Werner Hoyer. He's done us all a favor by, I think, starting a debate on European development architecture uh, with his thoughts on how the EIB should organize its operational delivery. And on the world stage, we have an eminent persons group uh, set up by the G20 to explore ways of making global development architecture much more effective. Now, these discussions are, I think, taking place at a rather critical time. The clock is ticking ever so loudly. The challenges are immense. The threats posed by climate change, the need to cope with uh, large migration flows, and the need to fulfill the sustainable development goals by the 2030 deadline, 12 years away. It's now obvious, I think, that a business-as-usual approach simply won't cut it. Uh, if we don't change our approach, I think we're in danger of waking up in, say, 2025 uh, to the realization that the SDGs can't be delivered by 2030. We haven't done enough to mitigate climate change, and migration remains as big an issue as ever. So I think we need to think big and think differently about the role that all the actors, including banks like mine, should be playing. And of course, as we approach the uh, publication of the Commission's multi-annual financial framework proposals, the opportunity to rethink and redesign our approach is there simply to be seized, I think. The financial pressure that we're all expecting around the MFF is a very powerful motivator. And indeed, I think globally, there simply isn't enough public money to solve all of the world's problems, 
and meet all those development goals that everyone signed up to. Crowding in the private sector to achieve our aims is increasingly necessary, and that's where the EBRD's experience of the past provides, I think, fuel for the future. Now, when the EBRD was set up back in 1991 at the initial behest of European giants like uh, President Mitterrand and Chancellor Kohl, the idea was actually quite far-sighted. It was novel, but far-sighted. The private sector focus uh, that they place at the heart of the bank's business model is now central to the development agenda. We're a rarity, though, in the MDB world. Under one roof, EBRD provides both financing for projects and policy reform expertise. We leverage that investment to try and get real and systemic change in the economies where we operate. Our private sector thrust was once ahead of its time, but now its time has come. Only, in my view, sustainable markets can deliver the EU's and the broader international community's development goals. Only by doing this can we create the private sector-led growth which is required for the next stage of economic progress, which will narrow the massive uh, infrastructure gaps, deal with the consequences of climate change, and the many, many other challenges that we're facing today. Now, we've had nearly 30 years of experience of bringing in the private sector money to deliver development goals. We recently reached a very notable landmark, uh, our 5,000th project since we were founded. It was a year, 2017, last year, when we delivered record levels of impact on the ground in our country's operations, investing 9.7 billion euros, uh, over 400 projects, uh, I think, uh, across a huge geographical area, spanning almost 40 countries now, and in three continents. Uh, we're a regional bank, but not quite a regional bank in that sense as well. More than 40% of our investments were in the green economy as well, helping to mitigate climate change. I think there was proof there that private sector money can deliver a public good. And we did all of that while making a profit of nearly 800 million euros, and with credit rating agencies once again reconfirming our AAA ratings. And we did that with many, many very interesting projects. I, won't, I don't have time today to go into all of them, but there are projects for local currencies, for, in local currency, for refugees, uh, expanding the motorway network in the Western Balkans, all different types of projects throughout Europe and in the neighborhood. Delivering all that investment meant delivering on development goals set by the EU and other shareholders. And we base our decision making now on six qualities, six transition qualities. They guide how we invest and offer advice to our countries, clients, and partners. We aim to make the countries where we invest more competitive, greener, better governed, more resilient, more integrated, and of course, more inclusive. Important too is Article 1 of our Constitution. We only invest in countries that can be seen to try, to try to be committed to and applying the principles of democracy. When the EBRD was set up, the philosophy was that building economic growth and the private sector would eventually, over generations, build support for democracy. Now, I think the experience is quite clear that that journey is not linear for many countries. It's often the case of two steps forward, one step back, but like the EU, we strive to stay engaged with governments even under the most troubled circumstances. The principles that we follow should be very familiar to the European Union and its development agenda. We work hand in hand with the EU alongside the Commission, the European Investment Bank, and member states. Last year, the EU co-financed the EBRD's work to the tune of more than 300 million euros uh, in donor funds, which we use as part of a blended finance approach. Over the lifetime of the bank, the EU has been the biggest donor by far to us. We work together on a women in business program, helping female entrepreneurs. So far, some 35,000 female entrepreneurs in 17 countries have benefited from this program. We work together on, say, a wastewater project in Cairo, which provides, I think, about 30,000 jobs for local people, as well as improving sanitation in the Egyptian capital. We're combining our expertise on the highway of peace, connecting Serbia, Kosovo, and Albania. Just examples in the past year alone the, of things we've done with EU help. And every time we do a project with the European Union, we make damn sure that the EU gets visibility for its role. Through the EBRD, the, EBRD, the EU is able to magnify its development effort. And I think a very close assessment of our work reveals that the EBRD has been a very significant driver also in European integration through our 27-year history. First, through investing in the Baltic and Central European countries, of course, as well as Bulgaria and Romania, part of improving their economies in a way that enabled them to join the EU back in 2004, then doing the same for Croatia and Slovenia, 
And now we're hard at work in the Balkans as part of the approximation process, trying to narrow the gaps to eventual EU membership. And of course, our efforts in Greece and Cyprus in recent years have helped stabilize the banking system there and helped to avoid what could have been a Eurozone exit. So today, I would argue that the EU and the EBRD are really very, very aligned now in many, many countries. One example I would give is the work we're doing together on just implementing EU conditionalities in Ukraine. Our teams in Kiev, they designed and implemented a complex corporate governance action plan for the whole Ukrainian energy conglomerate, Naftagaz, supporting the transformation of the energy sector in line with EU third energy package. We, co we collaborate closely with the SRSS and EU member states in design of reform and capacity building projects across many other countries too. I'd also argue that although formally speaking, the EBRD is not a EU institution, that actually turns out to be a bit of an advantage. It's a place where the EU majority can form stronger alliances with non-EU development partners or other major shareholders, such as the United States, Canada, and Japan. Indeed, for me, EBRD is a development answer to NATO, bringing in people from outside Europe, but in defense of European objectives and values. And we also have countries of operations as shareholders too, not just acquiescent re recipients. They have a voice, and we provide a platform for them to share their views with the EU to deliver European development policy and other policy objectives. So in other, in other words, EU and EBRD have shared goals and shared values. What next? Well, I think the EBRD's model has a lot to offer the EU and other shareholders. That's where we need the fresh thinking that comes in and really a, far, a more far-sighted uh, approach, just like those taken after the fall of the Berlin Wall. We can do more to deliver the EU's development agenda and without it actually costing the EU any more money at a time when future funding is going to be tight. The EBRD could invest annually another 2.5 to 3 billion euros a year if we can find the projects, and that's an increase of some 30% on what we're doing now. We have the capital, unlike many other institutions, to do that comfortably and still keep a sizable cushion to deal with contingencies. And we can do that in our countries which are part of the European Union, in the European neighborhood, and beyond. And by the way, an increase of two and a half to three billion in our investment mobilizes another six billion of investment into our projects from other sources. In total, that means as much as nine billion euros a year in extra investment firepower available, and without having to call for more capital from any of our shareholders and their taxpayers. It's a substantial amount. So we're now talking to our shareholders about exploring this approach, covering two elements. Further deepening our engagement in existing countries of operations and extending our work to new countries in the southern eastern Mediterranean, such as Algeria and Libya, and moving into countries outside of our region. An example might well be sub-Saharan Africa on a gradual and incremental basis. All of these options and any review of European and global architecture should, in my view, be based on the three very important principles. First of all, promoting sound reform in a coordinated manner. Secondly, market-based pricing to crowd in the private sector. And thirdly, an open door architecture, for example, in access to EU instruments and guarantees to create a level playing field for us all. Remember, the EU takes up 63% of our shareholding. So increasing and widening the e EBRD's imprint uh, increases the delivery of EU goals. I think there are plenty of precedents in the EBRD for shareholders thinking ambitiously about our contribution. It has happened four times before. Firstly, expansion to Mongolia, second to Turkey, then to the southern and eastern Mediterranean, and more recently, to Greece and Cyprus. And from Turkey onwards, clearly those additions have been countries that were never communist. And yet, in every instance, the bank has proved itself capable of acting swiftly and effectively. For example, in North Africa, the SEMED region, as we call it, we started operations only late 2012, and we've already got a portfolio of 7 billion euros, a great example of taking action in the European neighborhood. So I believe that EBRD's capital could be leveraged to greater effect. I also believe we could do far more together with EU funds following the MFF discussion. Now, we've over the past 18 months worked with EU institutions to establish the European External Investment Plan. That's a major change. It allows us to partner and to combine our investment capacity with EU financial instruments, EU grants, and our joint policy leverage to make a real difference to the business climate. Now, these financial instruments 
are not a panacea for every occasion. In many countries and for many vital public goods, of course, you still need grant financing. But there are circumstances when financial instruments make a lot of sense to mobilize private sector financing, to incentivize responsible approaches to investment prioritization, and so that money can then be recycled for new development purposes. I think that's all the more powerful if we can combine our investment work with support for policy reform. We've done this a lot, but we must do better on the coordination between the Commission and all of the development banks involved. We've got to be very, very vigilant that by using MFF-backed public funding, we don't unintentionally crowd out potential private financiers. The objective has got to be to syndicate and crowd in by seeking to price our products to the market. That's the starting point for crowding private finance in to our projects and priorities. We've got to remain additional. There's a lot to discuss, obviously, but at both the European and global level, I think the debate on delivering development agendas has got to be vigorous. It's got to be conducted quite swiftly. The world's problems simply can't wait. Agendas are moving ever faster to their deadlines for delivery. And crowding in the private sector, in my view, is crucial for the future of development, crucial for the EU to deliver its goals in a very, very tight financial context. And I think the EBRD can do more and is ready to do more. So I'd urge our EU shareholders to take advantage of the European in our name to deliver on those shared goals and those shared values. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Soma. If I were to follow up on your opening joke, I would say that the comedian would probably conclude that you're a Swiss knife, in fact. <laughs> uh, but the good news is that you, you, know, you eloquently said that's exactly what we need, that the sort of traditional thinking in terms of having a public subsidy for a certain purpose within a certain perimeter is not the way we should think about priorities today. Uh, so we'll open the floor for the, the discussion among the, the panelists. Uh, it, initially, I intended to have two rounds. I think we are cut short. We cannot have two rounds of, of, of comments, so we'll just have one. And I start with uh, you, Maria Thank you very much. Thank you, Zuma, for your insight, and thank you for coming to Brussels, even being late. Uh, we know how that uh, works sometimes with uh, transport uh, means. But um, I uh, will be very short for the sake of a discussion. I uh, uh, would like to tell you um, what I agree with you. So, first of all, I mean, yes, we fully agree. We share values and we share the objectives. We agree that uh, uh, EBRD uh, and its role in development is crucial for the operations we do. And I also agree uh, that uh, uh, the timing for this discussion is more than appropriate. Not only that we are in the crucial phase of implementation of the external investment plan, and EFSD, uh, not uh, only that we are discussing the new MFF, but we've been involved uh, together with you and other financial institutions in shaping the new architecture when it comes to innovative financing and development. And I would like here publicly uh, thank you for your uh, role and your contribution in that debate. I, um, I would like also to say that, of course, we are hoping from the development and international cooperation point of view that the next budget will be flexible and sufficient to respond to the current and future challenges. But we also know that uh, uh, we uh, should leverage our uh, scare public resources with the private uh, investments and private financing that, that you mentioned. Within the budget, we expect that investment instruments will play a significant role, and uh, we need to make most uh, 
of available public funding to leverage further resources for development. So we agree on that fully. And uh, as you said, there is not enough public money to solve the world's problem and to meet SDGs. Uh, we know we need uh, uh, trillions for that. And therefore, your uh, bank experience in crowding in the private sector uh, is also of the extreme importance for the European Commission. I um, would also uh, like to acknowledge your role in implementation of the EFSD and, uh, um, and the external investment plan. You all, uh, you're all familiar with our external investment plan, I am sure, with the three pillars uh, from starting from EFSD guarantee, technical assistance, and the political dialogue. And uh, I am happy to report that we have received uh, uh, very innovative and high quality investment programs for five windows that we made call for a proposal. First, the beginning of January and the second three windows were closed in March and we have received 46 uh, pips as we call them uh, many of them coming from you and uh, we are in the phase of assessing the proposals and uh, we are going to have a TAM meeting on Friday and uh, following the operational and uh, strategic board in June where we hope uh, we will uh, be able to take first decisions what um, we would like to use that as a showcase of our joint efforts to get the private sector on board uh, for decent job creations and inclusive growth and of course other objectives of the regulation but from my perspective our mutual challenge is indeed to attract not only attention of the private investors but also sustained engagement in a way that has a real impact in terms of human capital and all the investment that we are doing together. And of course, I would like to acknowledge Roro, especially when it comes to investment facility for the Asia, where you know you present around 85% of our operations. I would say that the shared goals and values of our uh, keynote speaker, you know, uh, also here for all of us to be delivered through the uh, shared project and activities. And I'm more than happy to answer more detailed questions. But thank you very much for sharing your views, and we, they will be taken duly account in the, uh, our debate. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let me give the floor to Thierry Deo immediately so that we complete the first yeah. round. Move Actually, along quickly. Thank you. Uh, thank you for inviting me today. I'll uh, speak from the perspective of the private sector and for a quick background perspective. Uh, we are long-term investors in infrastructure and, and energy transition projects um, in the EU, in other OECD countries, but also in developed, uh, developing countries such as uh, the African continent and also some Central Asian and, and Eastern European countries. I just wanted to perhaps uh, pick up on the crowding in private sector aspect of things, because I, I, I do think with the challenge we're facing, and, and by the way, for full disclosure and background, I should also mention that I'm a member of the investment committee of the European Fund for Strategic Investment, and I've been for the past three years working quite a lot on this blending instrument and financial instrument in terms of how to leverage more. Um, but coming back from where I come from in the private sector, what we do see is a lot of capital wanting to invest, but with limited channels to actually uh, access, uh, especially emerging markets and, and, and developing countries uh, investment. Uh, and, and to be totally transparent with you, some of us who are investing in those regions and in the OECDs, we typically refuse capital because sometimes of the lack of enabling environment to be able to deploy them. And typically we oversubscribe by two or three times the amount of capital that we want to use to, to deploy. But I wanted to, to come back uh, as over the years our partnership and work with EBRD amongst many of the developing institutions but I would praise its particular focus on 
uh, private sector development and crowding in, and, and that's quite rare for, for an MDB, um, very rare, actually too rare. Um, <laughs> and, and that's probably something uh, in any European development uh, uh, policy plan that should be uh, put a focus on is how to crowd in the, uh, the private sector. One uh, in two or three aspects that I would sort of mention, um, one is really creating enabling environment with governments. Um, I mean, I, I have a, a, a number of examples, but if I can pick one in terms of where EBR, EBRD side by side with us uh, discuss with the Turkish government to actually pretty much standardize and rewrite their uh, contractual framework and now allow them to really deploy about 15 billion in public hospital spending that they were struggling to, to deploy for many, many years before we actually engaged uh, together with EBRD. Uh, let alone that the, the project preparation facility that is quickly, uh, that can quickly be mobilized is also a helpful tool for these governments. And often, and this is really the bottleneck as we see it from the private sector, the capacity of government to actually engage with private sector and create project is the first bottleneck. We can throw billions at it if, if we're not actually capable of deploying um, these capital through projects, uh, it's, it's really the, the biggest hurdle. The, the other way that I've seen um, this crowding in, I mean, we, we initially, about five or six years ago, initiated a relationship with EBRD by which they actually helped us bring institutional investors who were quite reluctant to go into the regions of operations of EBRD, typically Eastern Europe and, and Central Asia, places like Turkey, but Jordan and other places. And by co-investing 100 million uh, in each of our funds, we actually mobilized another billion of private capital that were then more comfortable really going beyond the EU borders and actually investing in these countries. So there is a signaling effect that has been quite important. That has been also true uh, in relation to the development of the capital markets within Europe. We've, we've done together by EBRD being one of the uh, sort of key investors, the largest project bond in Slovakia in the Eurozone. But Slovakia, <clears throat> I know they're sort of out of the, uh, uh, of the uh, cohesion countries, more or less, but uh, uh, it, it's been a, a fundamental pilot project to allow actually uh, investors and long-term investors in debt to, to really understand that there was a market there that they could participate and that the governmental institutions or BMDBs could actually uh, show them the way and help them to, in their way, de-risk uh, the subject for them. Typically, uh, risk is perceived by um, private investors, institutional investors, in two ways. One is really real, <laughs> because there is a real risk, and the other one is perception. Uh, the presence of MDBs does remove immediately the perception, almost, uh, and, and by using some of the risking instrument and the blending capacity that all these institutions have, uh, we can also remove some of the risk to allow and crowding a lot more uh, private sector. So I, I would really stop there for the first round and, and, and really conclude on the fact that <laughs> leveraging and crowding in private sector beyond all sorts of ideology is probably the only way that we'll be able to deploy more than a few billions in the few coming years in those countries. Thank you. Thank you, Jay. Let me now give the floor to Cecilia Ackerman. Uh, so you just uh, uh, joined your uh, Director for <coughs> Government and Public Sector Ma Market Development at MasterCard. Um, right. um, sorry for being late. I was on the same uh, train as Mr. Nakabati. Um, I'll try to read that into my speech somewhere. <laughs> um, I would thank you very much for your notes. And um, we um, almost thankful for the work EBRD does because I think it really looks at public and private partnerships as a means to an end rather than as sort of public private partnership for public private partnership's sake. Um, so MasterCard, um, we've done a bunch of work with Google in the last year and it's um, not because we are a lender and we're not actually sort of a credit card provider, um, but we, what partnerships are the basis of what we do. 
And quite often we come into the development space as the people that deliver once the capital has been invested. Um, so I've spent a lot of the last year on the highways of the Balkans um, because we're working with uh, local governments there who have received funding from the EU and from the EBRD um, through a local syndicate and they come to an international corporation because they need help in the experience of what has been done previously. And we're able to take our experience in delivering uh, sort of transparency, especially, for example, in the transport sector of how do you work with driving out corruption, uh, some that we've taken from developing a uh, transit system in, in Southeast Asia. Um, and I think one of the things that we will come into this space is, is the inequality space. So um, one of the learnings that we have taken as Mastercard since we started as a partner of banks to today a partner of governments, uh, the third sector and transit companies in delivering payment systems um, is that we have a responsibility for inclusive development. Because when, if you are a cash economy only, the, it, the things sort of work in a certain way. As countries develop, they become more digitalized. We have learned that we have to take responsibility because exclusion is really expensive. Um, so if you're, because you're a cash only person in a developed country, you will be the one who pays, who cannot have savings, who cannot take, um, uh, who cannot invest in business. So you hinder growth by creating uh, exclusion. Um, so we're really looking at inclusion through partnerships um, and it's really where we're looking at uh, development from this perspective um, because we don't think that our business can succeed in failing countries. Um, and we think that's what the private sector can bring to the table there is really innovation and we can bring the scale for the long term. Um, there is a big push in Europe for working with local partners and we always think that's preferable. Um, but we think there is a good work with partnering between governments, local players and international players to provide a long term feasibility to projects. Um, and we quite often bring a global best practice where we're able to, I'm able to take a step back and look at actually what have they developed here and how can we apply that especially to the CE which is developing really, really quickly. Um, and I think the same call is there is quite often people come to the private sector and I think there's some really good learnings from the CMU that we get a, that people come to the private sector because they have a wish list of something that doesn't work and that the government can't do because it's not feasibility. And I think that's where partnership really do work today because we can, there, there needs to be a level of de-risking on a government. There needs to be a regulatory certainty before the private sector can come into the space. Um, and only then can we actually really get transparency as to developing long-term projects. Thank you very much. Uh, before you have to, to squeeze out, perhaps we can have a sort of quick round of uh, discussion. Um, let me, since there seems to be broad agreement on a number of things, you know, on the uh, sort of the way forward. Let me ask you, and perhaps first, uh, Suma, what's critical? Uh, what's the, what will determine success or, or, or failure? Where, where is the, as we economists tend to say, where is the binding constraint? Um, so how you see it and, you know, how can it be addressed? Um, I, don't think, I don't think there is a silver bullet, but I would say one of the things that has struck me about the debate on the development architecture is the need for a mindset amongst shareholders, you shareholders, other shareholders as well, to think about whether really um, geography should trump business model. Uh, I used to think, I used to think country knowledge was everything. I have learned, I think, over the last 15, 20 years that actually it's much more of a mixed issue. I think you need to have a business model, you need to have expertise, you need to have a sector expertise, and you also need to have the structuring expertise, as well as knowing a lot about the countries. And when I, in my six years at EBID, what uh, I guess my thinking has developed further is that EBID has actually, not stumbled on, but I think worked out a matrix approach, which means you have deep country knowledge because you have big country teams. We could not have the scaling up that we've had without those country teams being on the ground. They know the political economy of the countries very well. They know how the market intelligence. They know how to navigate issues really well, allied to the big sector teams back in London HQ and in some of the regional hubs as well. 
That matrix has proved that our business model, which started off in just communist countries only, that, that was the only place we were going to be relevant, over time that's shown that actually the business uh, model, the expertise, has trumped the geography in large respect. And we've managed to scale up rapidly in all four of those places that Shelder said we should expand to, whether it's Little Mongolia, Big Turkey, Big Middle East, North Africa, and now Greece and Cyprus, very rapidly. That, is not, that wouldn't have been possible, I think, with a different business model, uh, a business model that put everything in headquarters, for example, or everything in the field. I think we've really done that. So I think that's the biggest thing. And I th don't think shareholders have almost realized, actually, that in those expansions, that's what they were saying implicitly. And now they should say it explicitly. It's a very clear point. Would you wish to comment or...? I mean, talking about uh, new architecture and uh, new landscape of, let's say, um, NDBs or do we need the European Development Bank? Of course, Commission is actively participating in this debate, and of course, we are assessing and looking into all possible options. But uh, what is the most important for us is that whatever we do next needs to have a clear added value compared to the status quo and needs to follow the development objectives that we put in place. So basically, it's a very important issue of the governance. Of course, if there is an important uh, issue of crowding in the private sector, as uh, previous speakers have said. Of course, uh, I agree with Zuma that there is an important element of troops on the ground that uh, makes a big difference. But I think whatever we'll do uh, in the future, it needs to be a collective work. It needs to be, uh, I would say, uh, coming out of the experience we have, building on the external investment plan that we are putting uh, in place together. And also, you know, having in mind that, as we said before, public money will not be enough. So that we, if we want really to make a difference in the developing countries, we will need to work together, all uh, stakeholders together with the governments and uh, the financial institutions. Thank you very much. Uh, perhaps we'll give you the floor to have your, your reaction to the, the point you made, which in my view, it's surprising because if you look at what we've seen on the scene in terms of the creation of new institutions, it has been largely on a geographical basis, right? I mean, we have this uh, <coughs> alphabet soup of um, acronyms of um, uh, new development institutions, but it's, it's largely defined by scope rather than by, by, by type of instrument and business model. How would you react to it? I mean, I, I, I would agree with the matrix approach to things because the geographies nowadays, um, if you look at it from an investor world, almost means nothing because <laughs> money is quite mobile and, uh, and when you try to tackle issues um, as, you know, co-development when you're facing an, a migration issue like Europe is facing, if you try to tackle it from a geography perspective, you pretty much take all the geographies that are surrounding uh, Europe to deal with it. So uh, geographies, uh, it's, it's important to actually be local, but at the end of the day, that's the only real geographic focus that you need. Uh, is to being able to to act on the ground that is quite important the rest is really your business model and whether you want to come with a lot of concessional money in a country versus an approach that actually develops the country's private uh, sector and an investment environment that's a whole totally different business model and i rather focus on the business model and how we leverage all the sources of finance around, whether local or international private finance, with public grants, concessional funds, or you name it, uh, versus a, a model that would be purely almost bilateral and public-public relationship. So I think I think we've we've moved away from that uh, entirely over the past ten years, at least, and that's sort of old history. And, and in fact, I don't think the recipient countries. Uh, are actually happy with that model at all. 
Just, uh, just to come back on it, Jean, I mean, I, Thierry and I are in the same place on this. I think, the, actually, if you look historically, in the late 90s onwards, uh, there were these creation of these special purpose vehicles in health, for example, Global Fund for AIDS, TB, and malaria, Gavi, and so on. So there was already a sort of uh, view that actually a set of expertise mattered more in certain areas, and the, you know, the existing system wasn't providing it. I think with the Asian Infrastructure Bank, it's quite interesting. I mean, here it is, sitting in Beijing, but it's defining its geographical scope as pretty global. I mean, it isn't saying, it started off by saying, what's Asia, and then said Egypt was in Asia. Fine, if that's what you think. But I think it's already uh, decided it will, you know, have members from Latin America, Sub-Saharan Africa, and over time will expand into those countries. So uh, they haven't got the personnel to do that yet, uh, or the business model yet, because they don't have people on the ground. But that is the ambition. Uh, and I don't think it's just a Chinese geopolitical ambition. I think that's actually the way development is going, because a lot of these issues are cross-border issues. So when we invest in Morocco, um, for example, we work with, say, clients in Morocco and banks, corporates. It's excellent, that we, uh, but their next question is, thanks very much, but we'd like to, uh, to expand to Senegal. Would you come with us? My current answer is I can't, because my articles don't allow me to. Uh, and they said, well, this is all very strange, because clearly you, you do this sort of stuff really well. You work with Meridium and others. Why can't you? Um, and so we have this sort of uh, demand, a business need almost, which we cannot satisfy because we're thinking still in the old terms of job. Okay, time perhaps to open the floor uh, for questions, uh, remarks from the audience. Um, the, the microphone over there. Can I start with a question? Yeah. I would love okay. to start with a question. Um, I would love to hear a little bit more. One of the things we're really interested in are big expansions looking at um, sort of Lebanon, Jordan, um, and those countries, and a few years ago looking at where we're working with IBRD, and my colleague said, nowhere. I went in and I started looking at what well, we're working with public sector, and very often the IBRD or the EU is invested, and then they call one of my colleagues in the local country go, we need help delivering this project. And in Europe, everyone's like, well, I don't see where else we can go. <coughs> but in my colleagues in the Middle East are very keen on public private partnership because they really understand it. And I would love to understand, it. from your perspective, what's your vision in terms of uh, development in this area? Um, it's a really good question. I've got Heike here, who's, of course, director for the Eastern Mediterranean, free body. But let me try and answer because I was in Lebanon recently with her, and what was quite interesting is the Lebanese have developed this new PPP law and suddenly made, you know, with there's now a possibility to do this sort of project, which, you know, just six months ago, you'd forget it. I mean, you know, there's no chance. So uh, clearly countries are coming... Uh, to re realize the regulatory environment is very, very important for how you design these uh, PPPs. We've got a hell of a lot of expertise of that, whether it's in Kazakhstan or Eastern Europe. We can bring that and we can come with projects, with partners who we've done the PPP <laughs> projects with. So I think you will see us doing, I mean, Jordan, um, we've done so many PPP projects in Jordan, and particularly in the renewables area. Um, I'm sort of almost getting sick to death of the number of uh, renewables projects we've done there. But no, it's, it's fantastic because it showed that we could do this and the Lebanese have seen that across the border and they want uh, more of that as well. So I think uh, you'll see more of that. By the way, I ran into Mike Froman in Washington uh, on Saturday and he was saying we should do more work with MasterCard. So, um, so I think we're on the, we're on the uh, you know, we're up for it very much to do that. Yes, please, over there. <laughs> Hi, thank you very much. My name is Antonia Potter Prentice from Alliance 2015, an alliance of um, seven European based um, humanitarian development organizations. Um, and my question, uh, in fact, it would be interesting to hear from all of you, but I don't know if there's time, is really um, uh, on a reflection that, of course, making um, more amounts of money available for development is, is all very well and good. But the question is um, how to make it available at the bottom end of the market. Um, if we consider, for example, the agriculture sector, um, <coughs> where we know um, the vast uh, quantity of foods produced by smallholder farmers, and, and let us remember that smallholder farmers are also part of the private sector, um, and the majority of those are women. Um, but I think that most of the sorts of investments that we're currently talking about um, don't go anywhere close to reaching their level. Um, and if we talk specifically about the EIP, um, I think a lot of the um, uh, 
of investment opportunities that are available are at ticket sizes that evidently, because of the experience of the uh, European Development Finance Institutions and other finance institutions, don't go below about 5 million euros. And of course, um, when you're talking about um, trying to create a sustainable, inclusive, green, local um, economies, uh, we're talking about a very different sort of model. So I'm just interested to hear with uh, all of the experience on the panel uh, what your thoughts are about how to make sure that the unlocking of new investment capacity actually reaches in a transformative way the very bottom end of, I mean, not only the agriculture sector, but obviously other markets as well. Thank you. Thank you. I, I can try to, to, to start. Uh, I mean, first of all, I think we sort of take for granted and forget to mention it that whether EU policy, the EBRD policy, is very focused on impact. Uh, and in fact, uh, the, the underlying, every investment that is made, uh, you, you know, we spend quite a lot of time thinking about what sort of impact it will have, whether environmental, whether social. And I can give you on those two examples, I'm not so much on the agricultural sector, but in Africa, and, and hopefully in the future with EBRD, but at the moment we're doing it with Paco uh, in, in Cote d'Ivoire, bringing um, sort of off-grid solutions with solar panel uh, that are actually sold on a consumer finance basis to people for a very, very affordable price over periods of five years, <coughs> where you can actually deploy 300,000 of those kits in Cote d'Ivoire in less than two years. That's a major impact for an investment which is actually fostered by a collaboration between private investors and, and DFIs. And so these things, we have the same thing in the same country, but this is really where we've created a biomass plant that is actually purchasing at a higher price from small farmers uh, the, the, the raw material to actually put in the biomass plant versus the large farmers that are actually giving it for free and are shareholders of the biomass plant. So there are many ways where you can actually shift these major investments and this collaboration because those principles are the same. I think we all focus on SDGs at the end of the day in all the different levels of the SDGs, and that's very important when you deploy capital, whether you do it for long-term investors in the private sector or you do it together with the DFI. So I think there's quite a lot of hope there, and that's probably where Europe is probably more focused on these things than any other large region in the world is that focus on SDG. Is that good enough for the Commission? Yeah. <laughs> it's never good enough. <laughs> But I'm, I'm going to tell you what is good enough for the Commission when it comes to the implementation of VAP. Because exactly what you said, I mean, we need to make a difference on the ground. So we created the uh, EFSD guarantee, especially, you know, to put the private business into the most more, more risky environment. So I want them to go to the fragile country. I want to do 20% of gender because this is something, you know, that is our priority. Of course, you know, we have an EVSD regulation. They need to do 28% of the climate change, etc., and renewables, you know. So basically, you know, in the guarantee agreement, there will be a quite a strict, I would say, conditionality, you know. Otherwise, the guarantee becomes very expensive. So there is, I would say, the incentive that the private business should use in order to get, you know, to the job creation at the end of the value chain and to bring the real difference, you know, also to the last uh, 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 lady farmer in uh, Côte d'Ivoire because uh, that, that's why we want to make a difference for the rest of the public, uh, I would say, scare funds. We are going, of course, to uh, concentrate on the sectors where the private business would not uh, be so inclined to cooperate in social etc. Thank you. I think there's definitely a space for broad range in uh, development. Um, so we're in Kenya, for example, there was a clear difference that um, <laughs> um, we've been working with a, um, a Kenyan bank, which has been funded by a number of development actors um, in helping agricultural. But the problem was with women. Um, so a lot of the male, men have bank accounts, whilst the, uh, which really stopped them from going that last mile. Um, and one of the amazing things was that the Gates Foundation helped work with whilst the 
on the labs in Nairobi, and we could look at how we can work with mobile money. Um, and together with this, and then that was the great thing, we were able to find a funded bank that we can work and look at, okay, can we look at how we can get, bring mobile money to farm, female farmers and learning, taking learnings from microfinance. We know that microfinance works really well in a, sort of like, from a gender perspective. Um, in some, a solution called Tukusa was developed, which really looked at um, kind of following the digital journey from very simple mobile transactions, um, which also then can work across borders. Um, and what we've had there is we've had government investment that helped the capacity building of creating a mobile network. So there's a lot of steps first that I think the development space does, and then uh, the private sector can come in as long as there's a, like help with a local partner and an international partner that can help deliver that. Just, just to quickly add to that, I mean, I think, to be honest, I think you're asking the, the toughest question for MDBs in a way because, um, you know, the way we operate tends to drive you to the middle of the market rather than to the smallest entrepreneurs. And so, you know, because of this problem of inequality, inclusion, so on, in, in many different facets, I mean, last year we put together an economic inclusion strategy at EBID to try and actually try and respond to this question. Um, and it's, it's obviously about, for example, female entrepreneurs, which you mentioned. Agribusiness is one example, but it could be different sectors too. It's also about youth unemployment in many of our countries too, um, which is really quite serious economic, social, and political problem. And then it's about underdeveloped regions. Um, so, you know, we all go to Turkey, go to Istanbul, and think, what's the problem? Um, but as soon as you go to rural Anatolia, you can see there's a huge development challenge. And so getting uh, MDBs like ourselves into those more difficult sectors, where issues of access, affordability, all those things will come up, uh, is one of the biggest challenges. And we've had to, in EBI's case, reorient the way we do some things. So, it's only in recent years, for example, to take this model of being on the ground, we've started opening small offices in countries. You know, in the Middle East, for example, we're the only MDB that has offices in Tangier, Sfax, uh, and uh, Alexandria. And we'll have more in the next few months uh, because that's the only way we can reach these smaller entrepreneurs. We can't really reach them from the capital city. They're not there. Uh, we've also had to redesign our Women in Business program to provide quite a lot of advisory services, not just direct loans, because quite often, as we were discussing earlier, the projects are not actually put together very well in the first place to be financeable. So you've got to help them with advice first. So it's made us rethink, actually, the way we do these things on the ground, which I think has been a good thing for us to do. Um, but it's still hard work, actually. It's a hugely resource intensive as well to design these packages, I think, compared with the bigger projects that we do. Thank you so much. My name is Maria Victoria Wolf Marreiro. I am uh, representing the Spanish government here in Brussels and uh, I'm involved in development cooperation in the Council. Um, I would have two questions. One is, is uh, around uh, the end of uh, geography. So when the EBRD uh, was created, that was the area of the end of history, the Fukuyama say. Now we are confronting somehow the, the area of uh, the end of geography uh, because of digitalization, because of virtual reality. Um, but actually, we, 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 we know that uh, development uh, is on the ground, of course, that poor people are on the ground, uh, that is, uh, the, 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 and they are our public and they are our clients. Uh, so, um, uh, uh, we, are, we are very often talking in, in the development area about localizing SDGs. Uh, um, so, uh, my, my question there for, for the private sector representatives, uh, that would be uh, around the incentives uh, you really get uh, um, uh, to, to uh, uh, implement SDGs in the least developed countries and fragile, fragile states and post-conflict countries. What are your incentives there? But what are your incentives in general about this narrative of the SDGs? Uh, because very often it's not so clear in terms of taxes, for example. You are maybe not uh, really uh, <laughs> very much supported by, 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 by uh, governments. Uh, um, and my second question uh, would be related with, uh, with, with the development of digitalization and then uh, uh, bringing it to sharing economy. We have heard now uh, sort of 
from a very, very liberal approach uh, to economy, and I can understand that, of course, from the uh, starting point of the EBRD, but uh, we are now in a, another phase. And uh, so how do you say, how do you see uh, the, 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 this collaborative, uh, you were mentioning that um, uh, era, and um, yeah, uh, I was about to, to raise the, 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 the example of Kenya and the M-Pesa solution. That's, uh, that's really a very interesting one. So your, your views on, on that. Thank you. Uh, perhaps you can start with the SDGs. You can do the second one. <laughs> um, <coughs> I mean, we, 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 we are, and when I founded my company about 12 years ago, Auto is still investing for the community. So I was beyond before SDGs, if you want, but how do I convince investors that there is an incentive for them in it? Uh, first is the, a clear risk management tool in deploying SDG. Uh, and I think uh, every reasonable long-term investor that is looking at uh, whether, you know, extreme weather uh, risk or uh, long-term political risk, it has to focus on SDG because the only way you can actually reduce the volatility of your uh, investment as a long-term investor is really looking at all these things going forward and see how can I mitigate them. And, and when you do, uh, I mean, obviously on the, on the environment, it's quite easy to do almost. I mean, if you carbon, low carbon focused, and if you really looking at stress tests for investment in terms of, you know, what worse can happen to it in relation to severe weather condition, you know, even insurances are doing a lot of work today on that, so people are focused on that. When it comes more to the impact and the social side of it, it's all about engaging with communities to actually mitigate the impacts of political derailment on your own investment. And when you are in countries where there's the rule of law and you can go to court for anything, it's quite easy to forget about these things. But when you're in countries that are maturing and where uh, governments change a lot, there are many crises, and government capacity and administrative capacity is quite weak, your most solid partner is actually the beneficiary of your projects uh, from a fairly broad perspective. So, and it's not only about the immediate impact. I mean, when we make investment, for example, when we invested in Senegal in the first, the largest Western Africa uh, power plant, solar plant, uh, we've actually set up a mutual fund for women businesses in the two villages that were around. And today, between the jobs that I've, I created with small businesses, we, we've got more support from these people that we'll get from the politicians around. <laughs> uh, and, and it's really a, uh, a long-term engagement process a, and, a, and a risk mitigation process. Uh, and that's sort of level one of what investors should do. Um, I'm a believer that we are sharing a common good and therefore we have to do these things not only because it makes money, and these things actually do not cost you returns. Whoever investors tell you that is, is actually uh, lying because it's insignificant in terms of financial impact versus a great impact on the social side of things because it, you're talking a, a ratio of one to 10 at minimum in terms of uh, the, the, these type of things. So it, it's quite important to engage and to actually also take care of that common good uh, when doing these things. Um, I follow up on incentives and why private sector goes into, so, and this is one of those conversations I will have to try and convince our stakeholders and our shareholders. Um, so if you think about, take a, for example, a small Turkish city which has received development funding to improve its infrastructure. Um, then they have two choices in how to make that work in the long term. Either they put really punitive fines if someone doesn't pay for their ticket, um, or they can make it really easy to buy their ticket. But quite often someone goes for somewhere between and makes it quite difficult to use to transport unless you bought a ticket. Now, someone like, okay, that looks like a solid investment. We'll help go in and build so that you can put an oyster system in and you pay. Now that works until you got to a situation where Seven, so 40% of the population can't use the system because there is no financial infrastructure, no one has a card. The bank isn't interested in providing these people with a way so they can pay. 
So you can have a really nice incentive of let's improve the ecosystem infrastructure here. But if we don't have the supportive ecosystem, and we look at it from a business perspective, okay, well this makes sense. This the business model of providing this transit would make sense, even at that kind of sixty percent. But we've learned that in the long run that's not going to work. Um, so we then try to work with the local banks to say, okay, well, can you can you make this work? If that doesn't work, then we work with the local government and we say, maybe you want to put social benefits in a digital means because the banking system is not going to catch up with your digitalization efforts. And that might be that you bring Uber in. You bring, a, you know, there might be any kind of level where you bring digitalization in quickly. Um, then might, they might, you got, might go work with the government. So I do quite a lot of that work where you go and talk to government about maybe we should do this in a digital means because then you create a whole ecosystem. And for us as a business, that makes sense because we know that that is the most sustainable way which will get return on the investment of, okay, we put the turnstiles in, but actually we'll, we'll make sure that this works for everyone and that's the only way it's going to work in the long run. Okay, I have one question here and one there. Okay, uh, Lucio Vinjo Souza, lead the economics department on the internal think tank of President Juncker at the Commission. I would like to reopen the question of the ecosystem. Uh, Suma, you made uh, what I think is a very cogent case for diversity on the ecosystem. It's from this point of view uh, a pity that Margeta has left us. But let me play devil's advocate here. We already have what I think you yourself described as the alphabet soup of international, multilateral, and regional development institutions. One could make a case that the reinforcement of uh, specific union delivery tools, we can think of this as uh, either a reinforcement of our existing development banks, or the reinforcement of networks between the union banks, so the AIB, and uh, the network of uh, national development banks would enable us to be more effective and more visible in terms of the delivering of the strategic objectives of the union. It's a cost-benefit analysis in the end of the day. Our economists are intimately knowledge of the question of every single option in life has pros and cons. So from our own point of view, uh, speaking as a union official here, the question is what is more effective for us to deliver the objectives of the union? A more centralized type of environment or a structure in which you have the diversity of tools that we currently have? This is not only a question that we should be grappling with and we effectively are, but our counterparts, both at the level of the partner countries and at the level of the private sector counterparts that they have to evaluate. What is more effective in the end of the day? A more concentrated type of structure or a more competitive type of one? This has implications for all those that are involved in this discussion. So uh, to try to uh, get your reactions on this devil's advocate type of, uh, uh, type of intervention. Let, let, let's, uh, let us take the last question uh, over there. Thank you. My name is Isabelle Brache. I work for ActionAid. ActionAid is a, is a development, non-governmental organization. Thank you for this debate and also the, the very concrete experience you share. It's really useful because it's sometimes so theoretical and complex. I would like to come back to inclusiveness or fight against inequality. I understand from the presentation that um, it can be included already in the design of the project to really be inclusive, and in that case it works better. But I also um, wonder whether in that case there would be best practices somewhere based on the ongoing blending work that could be used um, by the European Union for the external investment plan. Um, because in the investment windows we have seen so far, it's not very much present yet. Um, and my second remark on this is that, Mr. you say that in certain cases, blending may not be the most appropriate tool to reach the poorest, and we would very much agree with that um, as well. So in that case, what would be an ideal balance between ODA being used to leverage private finance and other forms of development cooperation, in terms of speaking of the EU at least? Thank you. 
Okay, perhaps we leave you the last uh, word. Are there some comments? Just, just, yeah, very, very quickly on, on, on this. Um, I think we, we like the diversity, but a coordinated diversity. I'm not sure <laughs> competition amongst public instrument is a very good thing. We've seen it in Africa, and, and actually two or three years ago, I think a lot of us around here had, were around a table at the, in Davos thinking, okay, the MDBs now need to talk to each other and stop competing with each other, certainly because they have sometimes some similar instruments. So I think coordination and focus and, and again, business model. You know, it, it's it's not about whether you use you know blended or grant or, or whatever. Is how do you measure the impact and what's your goal? Uh, and this is what the EU should focus on: is is imposing criteria and targets on those institutions with a different instrument versus knowing which one of the instrument is doing what. And I think this way we can we can do it. And just quickly on the inclusion, there's quite a lot of work that is actually being done on the group of MDBs on inclusions. <laughs> and, and also, as, as I chair this association, the uh, Long-Term Infrastructure Investor Association, we've actually published a handbook at the time of COP21, which is being updated every year on how to create inclusion, environmental and social inclusion on, on investment in infrastructure. Thank you. And in reflect on a comment, um, I think sort of coming from a finance background, I think there is too, we could do too much complication in terms of the structuring. And the, to my comment earlier, the sort of the public-private partnership just for the sake of public-private partnership. But I think there is, for example, with the EBID, there are overarching principles that the private sector then delivers to. Um, and I think the EBID is an excellent way of ensuring that on the ground. So then when you work with EBID, you are aware of those principles. And that includes, for example, um, sort of having a lens of how this will affect women or how will it affect sort of inclusiveness. Um, and I think there are other developments that could do that with more consideration, especially in terms of when we think about the difference between an SME and a micro-enterprise. Um, but I definitely think those are really good overarching principles that the private sector just has to deliver to. Thank you. Thanks. So let me, um, let me try and answer the devil's advocate question. I mean, I, my starting point is I don't, I don't think the multilateral development bank system is composed of perfect substitutes. It's composed of complements, essentially. So if you take a look at why did the African Development Bank invite EBID to come to North Africa with open arms? Because Donald Kabaruko, when he was heading it, said very clearly, we're not a private sector-focused bank. EBID is, and North Africa needs that, particularly now. And we will stick to the more of the public sector type projects through the African Bank. So I don't want EBID to start becoming an all, all singing, all dancing type bank, trying to do budget support and everything else. I don't think we're incredible in that area. I think we should uh, you know, try and advance the range of products and instruments in what we're already good at within our business model, if you like. So I think it's a, it's a very much a complementarity game. But within that, I do think some development principles should be common for all of the players. And I mentioned those three, the pricing to market, policy reform, policy coherence, and also, I think, the open architecture approach. I think that's fundamentally important for all of us to follow if we're going to crowd in, particularly. At the end of the day, I think um, I would say the European Union's best uh, advert for what it does well is impact and effectiveness. You know, you, you can't really market project failures very well, so it's best to have project successes. Um, and, uh, you know, each of these institutions, through their own skill sets, will have their successes. And in our case, it's going to be around the private sector, obviously. But others will have others, I think. On the inclusion point, um, I think this is really interesting. If you looked at EBRD in 90, circa 1991, what would we have said was the way forward to a sustainable market economy? We probably have said there was only one quality that really mattered, competitiveness, and we'd have focused on that. We might have thrown in governance as well because Fukuyama had just written about all that sort of stuff, but we wouldn't have included inclusion. It uh, was not there, or green. You know, Those things came later, so we now have six qualities of what makes for a sustainable market economy, and I think it's a much more modernized concept now of uh, the, what the market does. And so we, not just at project level, but also when we're trying, not just when we describe projects, but when we actually work on projects, just like 
Thierry uh, and Cecilia said, we will be doing all of this work with communities on the ground to try and find out how this affects different communities in different ways. And to, to your question about when is blended finance unlikely, well, I mean, again, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, I would have said there was a larger category where blended finance wouldn't work. But I've, you know, I've obviously changed my mind a bit about that. Municipal services would be an area where I think it does work very well uh, these days. But there is a category for me still of, say, things like primary education, primary health care, which it's very difficult to make blended finance work well and where you need the state and you need, I think, uh, grant financing in bulk, uh, in bulk to really make that work well. Thank you. I think we have to close now. Uh, let, me, let me thank you very much and please join me in, in thanking all, all the panelists and especially. <laughs>